Here we go. All right. There we go. You didn't hear me talking, did you? Because I didn't have the mic on. That's how loopy I am today. I took one of my nice pills last night, but the heavier one. And it's made me a little loopy, a little uh, whatever. So, uh, but boy, there are a lot of people waiting to get on. I don't know why, because geez, this show, this show is popular with the callers. That That's what it's all about. And we got some nice callers. Let me make sure that all the callers that want to get on are legitimate. Because lately on the other show, we've been getting a lot of people who are illegitimate and then show me porno films, which we don't want. Okay. We just don't want. Hello, Shecky. How are you? I'm good, Ben. You? Okay. I'm good. And uh, Marjorie, how are you today? I'm good today. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Since we never talk, so I have to yeah. find out. Yeah. Um, Len LaFrisco out there near Frisco. Uh, how are you, Alex? How are you today? I am well, thank you. A little tired, but good. Thank you. Yeah, I'm uh, I, I've been tired all the time anyway, so but then Shecky's tired too, as well. So <laughs> we have people who are uh, we have elderly people, <laughs> we're yeah. elderly people. We get tired. Uh, you know, I doze off at the, at a moment's notice. So it's, uh, do you doze off a lot, uh, Shecky? No, not really. Not really. Oh, I might okay. take a nap in the afternoon. Okay. That's about it. But you're, you're, you know, you're about, uh, what, 15 years younger than me? Well, 67. 67 years younger? No. <laughs> no, no. 67. <laughs> well, that makes it about 15, 16 years. 15 years, years yeah. Yeah, 15, 16 years. I can't count. Hello there, to Charlene out there. How you doing? Hi. Chico? Doing good. It's raining hard. Is it really? Yeah, here, here too. Yeah. Boring. Yeah. Snow yeah. all over the place. It's snow wild. all over. The, they, they're getting snowstorms in San Francisco. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know. Well, they got snow in Los Angeles the other day. Yeah. Yeah. And we get no snow here. We're supposed to get snow. We get snowflakes. We're supposed to get snow tonight. We're supposed to get one to two inches, three inches of snow in Central Park. Oh, wow. um, anyway, Scott Boddicker, how are you doing out there in Texas? You got any snow out there? Nope. Sunny in 72. It's nice. Uh, Jack was telling me the other day that it was uh, quite, uh, sleet, a lot of sleet or something. or uh, ice? Not well, that's recently, what, that's what not killed recently. Charlie Wallace's power was the ice storm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was Charlie. Charlie got it bad, yeah. Charlie got it bad. Scott, they don't dare turn off his electricity. Nah, I don't care. <laughs> yeah. Shut it off. Uh, Mandy O'Brien. Hello there, Mandy, down in uh, uh, the state that's about to probably charge Donald Trump with all kinds of horrible <laughs> things. Maybe. Yeah. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we don't know yet, but uh, it's it's looking it's looking pretty good. Yeah. yeah, but the woman in charge of the grand jury seems to be a bit of a nutcase. <laughs> oh, my well, God. Why yes. she opened her mouth to begin with is beyond me. Yeah, but she really fucked things up. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, but uh, she, uh, but she, and I don't know what she was planning on doing with it. I guess she wanted the publicity, right? Yes. Yeah. Why did, they, why did they make interviews. her? What I'm wondering I, is why they, and we're not talking about politics here, we're just talking about common sense. Why anyone would make her the foreman of a jury? Not sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's but. not telling you too much about the jury. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, let What's me see. But SNL, James Austin, whatever his name is, does such a good Trump. And the SNL opening, cold open this week, was really, really funny. And it had them. You mean, well, then let me write that down, because that's the first funny thing they've done in 20 years now. <laughs> it's not, but I hear you. I watched that show. I didn't stick with the opening. And then I tried to stick with other stuff, and it was just horrible. James Austin Johnson's Trump is incredible, though. He yeah. does a really funny Trump. I don't think so. No, you don't like it, really? You like yeah. Baldwin better? No, oh, I like Baldwin better. Yeah, he before he good. shot somebody, <laughs> you know. Uh, I, uh, I I really like his I really like his Trump a lot. Really, um, boy, yeah. Saturday Night Live has not. I don't think I can't remember it being funny in the last twenty years. Did you see when um, Pablo from Last of Us was on a couple weeks ago? Yeah, the Mario Kart sketch was hilarious. 
Boy, what you find funny and what I find funny are two ex- entirely different <laughs> he's things. He's Canadian, <laughs> Alex. Oh, yeah, he's a Canadian. That's true. 30 years younger than you, too. 40 years younger. <laughs> yes. Uh, so anyway, uh, so but I, no, I just said I, I, it's amazing. I, I watch it. It's kind of like a habit, you know, but I watch it, but I, I zip through it. Usually go to the news segment, which sometimes is it affords us a few laughs, you know. Yeah. And uh, uh, but uh, then Marjorie says, was there anything on there last night that was funny? And I go, no. You know, occasionally there have been like one or two things that were you know, that were funny. Uh, I didn't and, like the Kate McKinnon years. Uh, I, listen, I think the performers have been terrific over these years, but I don't think the writing has been terrific over these years. Gotcha. And isn't that where the show has to have its best thing going for them? You know, so, yeah. yeah. So anyway, I uh, showed Marjorie this week's uh, Last of Us, and she was completely bored by it. And I found it kind of dull, too. Uh, wow, coming from Alex. Well, I found it dull because uh, I think they could, I know what the plot's supposed to be, and I think they, he, they could have done a better job with it. And the guy who wrote the game wrote the script, and he was writing it like he was writing the game. And the game, you, these cutscenes go by much slower than normal dialogue and you know, back and forth and so on. I, I think he didn't know how to write for TV, what I think. What did you think of it, Mike? Uh, I haven't watched this one yet. We're only oh. on episode two so far. I'm waiting for, Tandy and I are going to inhale the rest of them over a next weekend or two. Oh, so you don't know that Joel dies in this one. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, folks, and I'm not. I hope I'm not spoiling anything for you because I played the games. He does get killed in the second game, so <laughs> you know. Which uh, we did watch 1923, though. Isn't that great? 1923 is just it, wonderful. It's a brilliant show. You watch it, don't you, Shecky? Oh, very good show. Yeah, That's true. yeah. I mean, uh, he, he, the love story in that show is really something you know uh and helen mirren and helen mirren's fine you know Can't go nothing, wrong wrong, with her. nothing wrong with helen mirren you know so that was uh, uh let's see here so when else were we uh, so uh yeah so we watched that uh but uh uh you know the last of us overall i think has been very good uh, and uh, yeah. if, they, if they had a slow episode, I, I kind of can give them that, you know. One slow episode? Oh, you you just stop it. Stop what? Stop it. <laughs> Overall, it, it, Shecky can't comment on it because that's what he's going to binge watch on his cruise. <laughs> right? No, I'm going to wait till the whole series is over. Then it's no, well, it's over in two weeks. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know. Uh, if you, you know, uh, I'm, I, you know, I, I think you, you, that binge watching, that would be much more fun than every week, you know, so whatever, but when you get to episode seven, expect it to be slow. Okay. That's my, hello, Paula. Hi. Hi. What, what's happening where you, uh, where you are? How's the weather? Not at all. The, weather, the weather's boring today. It's rainy. It's cold. It's not not fun. But um um, we don't have any blizzards. We don't have any tornadoes. And yeah, okay, that's Oops. nice. Uh, and by the way, isn't that an old Letterman bit? What's the weather? How's the weather where you are? Where he would call people and then just pick a n- number at random and then say, "Right, Mike knows the show better than Shaggy does." Uh, <laughs> But am I right? It was like no, uh, that is something they did. I do not know the show better than Shecky does. But yes, how's the weather? Uh, was yeah, certainly a- I thought that was brilliant. I thought that was just brilliant, nice, slow television. You know, uh, I, I I tend to watch. I'm tend to be watching more the the NBC shows now because they were just very inventive. I mean, it was just the kind of thing that well, I. Well, yeah, when we got to the Ed Sullivan Theater, it became the big whoop de doo. 
you know, and well, was, yeah, and they also spent how much to fix that theater and to pay Dave and all of that, and they expected to get their money's worth. Yeah. And doing all that experimental stuff probably would it would it have played at twelve thirty at eleven thirty eleven thirty five? I don't, I don't know. I mean, he did some of it, like throwing stuff off the building and stuff like that. You know, yeah. Which I always found when Dave Letterman would throw stuff, he, he used to use, I think, a fire tower, fire training tower. Yeah, one. and then eventually we did it at the yeah, Sullivan Theater because the training tower was knocked down. Right. And also because you could, because they would close down that. Well, we had a roof. You know, we... you, you had a deal with <laughs> in New York that anytime you wanted to close down that street, you could close down that street. So then you could drop watermelons out of it and uh, various and sundry different things. And I always, that's for some reason I love that bit. I mean, it just, just made me feel wonderful seeing a watermelon smashed to pieces after being dropped off a how many story building? 12? Well, the office building, what was it? 14 floors? Yeah, 14 floors. Yeah. Yeah. Something like that. But anyway, so that's that's what I watch. Uh let me see here. What else is uh, what else is happening? Uh that isn't isn't going to get us talking about politics. Although there's nothing really to talk about in politics, you know. I mean, it's just we're we're off to the races again. It's now, well, who's going to be running for president? And I'm going, isn't the presidential election t two years away? You know, next year, yeah. Alex. Huh? Twenty four. Well, it's it's uh, the, well, it's almost the, two years. It's the end of next year. I mean, this is too early to do all this stuff. Well, you have all these twenty-four hour news channels and they need something to talk about. So you just did, but um, it's stupid. It's just stupid. Uh you know, this one's too old. This one is a woman. This one is yeah, fine. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh and 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 they're all taking oh, who's gonna who will how will uh DeSantos? I wonder is, are people gonna mix up DeSantos with uh our 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 uh, New New York uh Congressman, guaranteed, huh? Guaranteed, people will mix it up. Yeah, I hope they do. Well, you just did, <laughs> huh? You just, you just did. No, I did it on purpose. Well, uh, yeah, but the Florida governor is DeSantis, and I know New York is okay. Yeah, well, I'm trying to get it going so everybody go. thinks that it's the same guy. See, <laughs> well, yours sounds better than DeSanctimonious. Oh, yeah. Well, he should call him DeSantos. <laughs> Is what he should do. Yeah. Excellent. But you know. Hey Alex, can I uh can I tell you a, a joke that Steve Young wrote for me? Wrote for you? Yeah. So yeah, okay. he 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 te texts me out of the blue one day and he says, I got a joke pitch for you for the Letterman podcast. And I immediately just copied and pasted it and put it up. Um Steve Young wrote me and said, Okay, uh regrettably canceling an upcoming appearance on the Letterman podcast. It turns out Representative DeSantis never had, uh, was never a writer on Letterman. <laughs> right? I don't get it. Well, it's the Letterman <laughs> podcast, right? And normally yeah. I have people who are writers on the show or whatever. Yeah, on right, there. right, right. So regrettably having to cancel an upcoming appearance, it turns out after looking into it, after it turns out he was never a writer for Letterman. I see. Okay. Man, he's lying about everything. <laughs> Okay. There it is. okay. Okay. So um anyway, give so Steve Young a shout out. Hmm? Give Steve Young a shout. Yeah, I got I got I got to tell you a quick story. I did this the other night on the show, but it it was uh I had to go to this doctor who's a the name of the company is something like uh Cancer and Blood something like Technologies or <laughs> Inc. Inc or whatever. And uh my my personal doctor recommended him, and also the doctor that wanted me to go to him was my neurologist. So I decided to go to this guy, and it's a big operation. And they call he's got the name cancer is the first name on it, which you know it doesn't exactly. I don't think that's a real good name to have on a company. You know, <laughs> I mean, if if let's say, oh, I don't know, Elon Musk decided to call his car the cancer, you wouldn't buy it. You know. <laughs> 
But anyway, the second part of their name is blood. All right. So I'm going to him because this maybe there's something wrong with my blood. I mean, at my age, it's purely possible that there is and that we can find out what it is and do something about it. Or if it's something that could uh, put my life in danger, give me the medicine that stops it and whatever. So I, I'm OK with going there. But blood and I get this blood is in the name of their company. So what would you think they were really good at? Blood. Blood. Right? Phlebotomy. Phlebotomy. Exactly. Well, you would think that drawing blood, which is the bread and butter of their business, okay, <laughs> would be, oh, the guys are out here working on our, okay. Anyway, where was I? Oh, yeah. You would Thanks think that point. blood was a very important part of their business. Uh, and drawing that blood, of course, is essential. So the first thing they do to me is they say, come in here. We need to draw your blood. Okay. And they got six little vials I got to fill up, you know. So I, uh, I I sit down and she puts a thing around me and she thinks she's found a vein and she goes and she thinks she's found it. But then she sticks it in my arm and very little blood is coming out, which leads me to believe she's probably getting the blood around the vein <laughs> rather than the blood in the vein. And she says, well, I can't get that. So she calls another guy over and that guy says, oh, well, here, I'll do it for you. And I said, the best place to do it is my in my hand. I said, I know a lot of people don't like a needle in their hand, but what happens is it's just easier to find a vein there because I'm an old guy and I have veins that show up. So he tries it. And I don't know if you can see it right now, but if I, uh, in fact, if I were to turn off the lights here, you could probably see it better. See? Yeah, yeah. yeah. See? That, that's what I got for that. Well, they couldn't get anything out of there. So they bring over a third person who now starts looking at my other arm and they finally find a vein and draw the blood, unfortunately. <gasps> oh, my gosh. Oh, shit. <laughs> Now, these people are supposed to be professionals when it comes to drawing blood. It's a, it's the, the lifeblood of their business. I mean, even if they're doing it's the, the what? <laughs> it's the lifeblood of their business. Even if their job, right, is to uh, um, draw uh, to deal with cancer, they have to draw the blood first to find the cancer. And I'm 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 sitting there, and they're, I'm getting mad. I'm re really getting agitated because I'm going. You know, I've I've been to okay. Other, I, I've been to other places where they. Oh yeah, okay. We found a little vein. Boom! They and they take they take the blood. This thing, it was like I was. Uh, I don't know. I uh, Al Qaeda was torturing me or something. You know, it was terrible. <laughs> It was terrible. I forgot to say hello to Edward Berger, by the way. That's right. And the reason I, I didn't say hello to Edward Berger was because I usually wait to say goodbye to him at the end. That's somehow, right. Somehow I thought in the same thing. You always skip over Edward Berger. Yeah, that's okay. That's okay? All right. Okay? Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. That's okay. All right. All right. <laughs> then your winces. Anyway, that's so um, uh, that was that was my story. And then I met up with the doctor and the doctor checked me over and he said, well, we'll let you know what the blood work is. He said, but you're you're not you're going to live a long life. He said, don't worry about it. You know, so then he felt my glands and everything. And he found one swollen lymph node in my groin, which might be a result of all the radiation that I had, you know. And he said, well, I'll let you know when I see the blood work, you know, what we what we want to do. And I said, you're going to do you're going to do a biopsy because, you know, that's horrible. They go into your bone. And uh, he said, uh, pro, pro, nah, he said, well, we have to talk about that later. But we don't we don't do biopsies that much anymore. We, it's mostly we can get the same information from blood work. So I went, well, that's nice, you know. Hence the title of the paper of the place, right? <laughs> the title is not is not biopsies and cancer. Well, <laughs> either that or they draw your blood and then they give you cancer. It could be yeah. wise name that way. So anyway, I just found that hilarious. You know, it was it was getting to almost be like a uh, 
a uh, slapstick comedy skit, you know. Well, uh, let's try the other arm. Yeah. So that's uh that's my adventures with doctoring. What's with these doctors these days? They're uh, only trained to practice. They're only they're only trained to avoid l- litigation. Is what all doctors are into now. They're, they're they're trained to treat symptoms. They are not trained to cure anything. Oh really? Yes. Somebody hmm. told me that about medical schools in this country. Really? All the medical schools in this country teach doctors to treat symptoms. Well, I would say the first thing a doctor probably should do is be taught how to find problems. In other words, to identify problems. You're kind of like a detective. And so you check all the ailments this person has and the blood work and so on. And then you say, oh, you've got blah, blah, blah. But then I think at least, I don't know, when I had my prostate thing, I think in yours, I think they treated that, didn't they? Yes. Yeah. So I you know, I'm, I don't know that I agree entirely with you, Vernon. But, uh, yeah. By the I way, know, huh? I know somebody, I know somebody, a, a young woman who just got a job. Uh, she has a, uh, she earned her PhD in humanities. And she got a job uh, teaching at a medical school, teaching doctors a course in humanities. Oh, like really? His, his, yeah, like history and like like the history of disease and and uh, who knows what else. I thought that was wonderful. Well, why? Oh, why, yeah. you, why are they teaching them humanities? Uh, I, I don't know. Is that that's not going to make them a better human being, is it? It's supposed to. It's supposed to. <laughs> Maybe it'll improve their bedside manner. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it could. Well, this guy kept shaking my hand all the time. It bothered me a little bit, you know. Well, that, what they want to have is is more more um, training in in dealing with people. Well, you know, I I just wonder how doctors are making money now, because I I was talking to my uh, urologist and I said, how's business? And he said, oh, I'm down to four days a week. He said, I decided to take one day off because I'm working too hard for what little I'm making as a result of the, the, the problems that I have. I said, with Medicare, he says, oh, no, they're fine. You know, they naturally they're going to lowball you, but at least you get the money. He says, it's goddamn insurance companies. Yeah. They're there. He says you you almost have to you know choke them to get the get the uh, money out of them. And I often thought about that. And I went, you know, we pay what Marjorie and I between us we're we're they're paying out uh, almost six seven hundred dollars a month for various types of insurance for health. And that for them to suddenly say, well, we don't want to pay. Hey, that's the bet you made. You know. You exact uh, you exacted money out of me for this, and um, I want to get my money's worth. You can't suddenly come back. And say, well, we don't cover that. What do you mean you don't cover that? Well, the thing to do is to be a shareholder, as I understand the system, mm. not a patient. Well, you know what happened at one time, and tell me if I'm wrong on this. Maybe some people remember this. Insurance companies were not allowed to make a profit. They were all nonprofits. They were all nonprofits. So until Reagan came in, I think. And when Reagan came in, he ended that. And so yeah. all of a sudden they became for profit. And now they're squeezing every dime that they don't want to have to pay out. You know. When I was growing up, when I was growing up, every hospital in my city was a nonprofit. We're nonprofit. Every hospital. Hospital. They were mm-hmm. usually owned by uh sometimes they were owned by religions, you know. Uh, and and they were philanthropic, most of them that I know of. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, it became a for-profit business, and I think that was the thing that was the problem. Yeah. What do you want, American or something? Am I an American? <laughs> yeah. We're un-American. <laughs> You're not a capitalist. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, uh, yes, uh, Charlene. I was just going to say, my husband worked for Kaiser Permanente. Oh, yeah. That's, uh, by the way, in case you don't know, that's doctor assisted suicide. <laughs> well, that, maybe. But that's a line from Larry Bubbles Brown. It's uh, yeah. <laughs> We're just really, really lucky, though, because we, in our retirement, able to keep those benefits. We pay $5 down 
medicine, five dollars doctor appointments. Yeah. I just had a gallbladder removed a month ago, five dollars. Yeah. Wow. Um, so we're we're really lucky because if it wasn't for that, if we had to have that supplement, all that other stuff, Medicare and all that other stuff, we wouldn't be able to make it. We wouldn't be able to pay all that yeah. insurance. Yeah. So it's but, ridiculous. It's when funny. I was when I was a kid, I was a I was a Kaiser kid. Mm -hmm. uh, because what happened was uh, Kaiser was started by Henry J. Kaiser had a automobile company and I think did some other stuff too, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, he um, in decided to insure his uh, employees with, mm -hmm. a, with a plan. And then he built a hospital to take care of that, those people. Right. And then he said, Oh, well, hell I'll expand this to unions. Anybody who belongs to a union can join Kaiser. And it was really, the, at, at the time, it was a real, it was the first example of socialized medicine practically in this country. And uh, he, uh, he then allowed unions to be able to subscribe to it. And we came in under that because my father was a member of the Musicians Union. And so I went to Kaiser all the time when there was a problem. And you go in and it was, I, I don't know if it was even five bucks back then. It might have been a dollar or something like that. But you paid a little small amount of money and you got a lot of health care. And it was uh, it was incredible, an incredible idea. But now it's just become a kind of an HMO and that's it. Mm -hmm. it's totally when, when, did, hmm? when did socialized medicine become a dirty word? Mm. Uh, anything. When I, I, I mean, that's an amazing thing about that kind of propaganda that's uh socialism like my socialism and socialized medicine is something well, bad. i always had a i always had a big question about why do you have why do you have a country why do you have a government if it's not to benefit the people you know and and what does a government when everybody gets together it's kind of like we're all it, it, uh, i don't know uh, paying in a little bit of our money to get things done. And then they don't do anything for us. And they argue about whether they should give us Medicare, whether they should give us Social Security. I mean, that's the thing a government should do for its people. You know, that's why you have a government. Otherwise, don't have a government, you know. Let the, the infected people run wild. Uh, you know, but I, I just, I'm amazed. I'm amazed that we don't have, better, you know, better medicine in this country. They do in Europe. Uh, oh, of course, of course. In Who fact, was the guy that did that? Did, did, did that uh, um, the interviews uh, uh, in Europe. He he does all those social things. Michael Moore. Yes, Michael Moore. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, uh, he oh, did, he showed that the, the kids don't have don't have uh, uh, debt from college at all. They don't even understand the, the uh, question. In that film, he took some people from the United States down to Cuba yeah. and let their hospitals take care of them. And their hospitals are great. They are damn good down there. And they're free. Uh, and I just don't know why we can't do that. I mean, I'm not getting I don't want to I'm not I don't want to get political on this show. So let's not go into that area. But I just don't understand why, as human beings, we don't care enough about other human beings to wish them well and to give them the ability to get that way. You know, I don't understand it. Like take Mandy here. She's our poster child for health here. Uh, you know, someday she may get sick and someday she may be burdened with hospital bills, which she shouldn't be burdened with. Won't you help this little girl? <laughs> now you have to look, you have to look really sad. You were talking about Kaiser. My mom has Kaiser because she worked for the state of Georgia and it is great. It it pays a lot, but I have this sore spot for them now because when she fell back in July and broke her arm and they sent her to the hospital, they just sent her home and it was completely broken in half. I mean, the word malpractice came out of my mouth and that usually doesn't happen that it's screwed. Wait a minute. She broke her arm and they didn't do anything to they fix didn't it? Do any she should have gone to surgery the next day or two days later, but they just put her in a splint and sent her on her way and <laughs> said for about six weeks. And my sister, we didn't know it was broken so badly, but. Did you finally get it taken care of? Well, no, it's still, it's still messed up. It's never really healed properly. Oh, she's not, geez. 
So that's, that was one reason why we had to go ahead and put her in assisted living because she really is definitely disabled now. So she'll sit there and say that Kaiser is still good though, because it's true. Like none of her medications. Uh, I would, I would, uh, I would, uh, you know, uh, suing is, uh, take is a long process. Okay. No, but but I, I think they should be threatened with suit, which may yeah. make them suddenly perk up and say, well, let's take a look at that arm and see what we can do about it. I, I, it's she definitely needs some kind of therapy. So I'm, I've I've got to get with her doctor about that. But but Kaiser, I mean, yes. And I had a very good friend that worked for them for a long time. She was in middle management, and she made really good money and has like a really good retirement. Well, you them. know what I felt really guilty about, and I got to say this uh, to Shecky, is that we kept saying to Shecky, maybe you should go. To, you haven't had a checkup. You haven't seen a doctor. Go, you got to go see a doctor. Didn't I? I? I was kind of pushing you on that one. Your friend Randy was pushing you on that one. So uh, he went to a doctor and the doctor suddenly went apoplectic saying, you have anemia. We have to send you to the hospital immediately. You've got to get a transfusion. But then the hospital wouldn't give me the transfusion. And then he went to the hospital and they said, you don't need a transfusion. Yeah. So he went home. So then you went back to the doctor, yes. right? And he said, oh, no, you got to get you got to get a transfusion immediately. And it, yeah, and then the last time I saw him, he's like, I'll see you in three months. <laughs> yeah, right. But what happened was you went in for the transfusion. Now, I'm no doctor, OK, and I'm not an expert on <laughs> these well, things. But somehow <laughs> I have the idea that if I get transfused, I don't know how long the actual physical transfusion takes place. I figure maybe an hour or something like that. You know, well, I think I told you they wanted me to stay there for. Well, well let me hours. finish. I was going to finish the story that way. They do the transfusion and then they keep him in the hospital for three and a half days. Mm. Was it three and a half or four? Well, I never got the transfusion. Well, oh, you never got the transfusion. Well, then what were you in the hospital for? To get a transfusion. <laughs> <laughs> this is like some comedy routine. I have, I have one, on first. Back, one fact to share with you that's just a commentary on what is the problem with our healthcare system. Mm -hmm. My mom did have to go to the hospital. Like she was so sick with a UTI, which is there. Apparently it becomes very common in old age, but I think she was always very susceptible to them. So she got yeah. really sick, fever, throwing up. So they sent her to the hospital. They didn't have a choice. She was only there. She was there for like two days. The bill, <laughs> the bill was $35,000. Wow. Jesus. And then she the, like a couple of days later like i think it was actually the day she came home from the hospital she was still kind of really a bit loose, not hallucinating but just really out of it and she tried to get out of bed so she just kind of slipped down onto the floor well the caregivers found her and they called the ambulance again took her back to that hospital i went the, you know at night to go be with her she was there for maybe seven hours that bill was ten thousand dollars Jesus. I, I mean, we got both. My, my, my prostate thing, my prostate thing ran between the two operations. One was the seed implantation. The other was the radiation came to over $100,000. Okay. That's actually like cancer, you know, curing. This yeah. was an infect, a urinary tract yeah. infection. No, that's ridiculous. This had a fever and they gave her antibiotics. It was 35,000. Yeah, but you know what happens? Once they, is your, your mother's on Medicare, I assume. She's actually, she's on Kaiser. She's so on saying, Kaiser. The senior advantage. Yeah, well, instead. what happens when Kaiser then goes to, because they'll take her Medicare and apply it to the thing. Yeah, it, it, it was, they send sent it. another, that she had $300 copay. <laughs> Yeah. So what happens is, is that, that you get these, these hundred thousand, like mine was $110,000 or something, but after Medicare told them what they could get, I think it cost them, they got 20,000, mm -hmm. you know, so. Uh, it just like a CT scan and it was like six grand. I'm like, why is it $6,000? I had two CT scans in the emergency room. I, I, I probably got a pretty good bill going from the emergency room there. But anyway, hello, Seraphin, are you there? 
What happened to Sarah? Yes, yes, Alex, I am. Thank you. Yeah, couldn't, couldn't, can't, don't, can't see you right now. Your camera is on. I'm trying to eat lunch uh, at work here, so I'm just oh, trying to be. Oh, I, well, it, you know, it's a new show called Lunch with Seraphim, ladies and no. gentlemen. <laughs> it's called Lunch while working and being too busy. Yeah. Good, to, good to see you all. You guys are all looking great. Yeah. Thank you. We appreciate it. Is that it? What's the line? <laughs> well, I did have, I did have one comment since we're all on the healthcare stuff right now. Yeah. Um, you know, it's funny that in all the coverage that goes on about, you know, what's going on at the U S border, mm-hmm. um, you don't see what's going on, uh, at, at other refugee sites and stuff like in Europe with the Ukrainian war and stuff. Um, mm-hmm. you don't see co- outbreaks of cholera, dysentery and stuff like that. And it's funny how nobody talks about it, but it's all because of the fact that everybody who's down there at the border who's Latin American is being covered by the national healthcare in Mexico and all the other states they come, all the other countries they come through as they come, uh, you know, to the north and to the border. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's funny, nobody ever starts a dialogue about how nice it is to have national health care in some of these countries like we don't have here. Well, you, just, wanted you know, comment, yeah. just wanted to comment yeah. on that. Yeah. Well, you know what I get from people when I'm, you know, we're like right wingers and they don't like socialized anything. In spite of the fact they don't complain about having a police department, which is really a socialized police department and a fire department, there's so, is socialism. And but anyway, they always say, yeah, but you know, in those countries like England, what kind of what kind of coverage and what kind of uh, 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 work are they you know are they getting? What how good is the medicine there? Uh, it's much better. It yeah, well, really it's funny that every single time that they show, a, a, you know, some video of what's going on at the border and everybody's lined up and piled on top of each other, they're all looking pretty uh, good in terms of their weight and their uh, general complexion and stuff. So, you know, nobody's dying at the border and uh, that somebody's got to be caring for their health somewhere. Well, they, so they, it's, they, it's just they, funny how they put the kibosh on talking about it. The main deaths at the border are caused by drowning and bullet wounds. You know, I mean, because you got those coyotes and stuff. But well, you also got people shooting from the other side with their fifty calibers and stuff, the Minutemen and stuff. So it's like yeah. it's a mess down there, but it certainly isn't a healthcare mess. Yeah. Anyway, good, good, good to have you calling, Seraph, and you haven't called in a long time. Yes, uh, Paula. I was. I wanted to ask Mike what what it's like in Canada. Um, I, it's so funny. Every morning growing up, I used to watch a show called Canada AM, which is kind of like the Today Show with my parents before I would go to school. It was on our national news uh, channel. And I remember when Bush Sr. was running for president, one of the things that Bush Sr. Uh, said in, I don't know if it was his first election campaign or his re-election campaign, but in one of them, the healthcare came up and Bush Sr. said, oh, if you think socialized medicine is so great in Canada, go ask a Canadian. He actually said that in one of his speeches. And one morning before I went to school, the news article that was on, was uh, CTV, or one of our national uh, networks, mm-hmm. sent out reporters in every major Canadian city to ask Canadians how they felt about their socialized healthcare. And I mean, no system's perfect, obviously, but like Canadians are like, it's one of the greatest things in the world. Like we had a survey come out a few years ago as who's the greatest Canadian was. And it was the, du- the guy who was uh, unanimously chosen was the dude who set up universal healthcare here. Yeah. Do you have to wait for an appointment? Is it uh, is, uh, is that is that a problem in Canada? So it depends on what it is. Like, um, if it's a non-emergency MRI, yeah, you're waiting. But if you need a bone set, if like if you have surgery, if something is like major, it usually is done fairly quickly. Um, well, listen, I'll, I'll give understand. you a good example. I'll give you a good example. We had a we have a guy who calls the nighttime show. His name is Trucker Steve. And he came down with a kidney problem and started having had to get off the road and be there for dialysis three days a week, which is not a pleasant uh, prospect, as you may know. And uh, he waited, I think, well, it seems like a year for a kidney to come around for his. Was it was it a year and a half here? You could wait. You could wait for three, four years for a kidney. You know, depending on where you are. So, I mean, they did it probably as fast as it would be done down here, if not faster. And in fact, he was uh, in line for it. And then for some reason, they called him up and said, well, we can't do it because somebody else has to get that kidney. And it was probably somebody who really physically needed it more than he did at the time. But I mean, 
that's just wise doctoring. You know, that's not as compassionate doctoring in a way. But he got his kidney now and he's uh, he's on, on the mend, as it were, you know. I have heard from people who, who um, live in countries where, where the health care is um, covered by the government mm -hmm. th that that um, the rich people have private insurance, uh, do it privately anyway, because the because the um, the attention is is better. So, I mean, I, you know, I don't, there's no system that's perfect, but ours is screwed up. Yeah, well, I mean, here it's it's. It, I, you know, there are doctors that I don't feel are for-profit doctors. I mean, my urologist is such a nice guy, and I trust him so much because he said to me once, he said, you know, he said, I, I don't do biopsies immediately when we're looking for cancer. He said, because I, and I could do it, he said, but I've got to have enough evidence to say that if I go in there and do a biopsy, I might find something. He said, so I don't do it unless I absolutely have to. But if I did it, I could do a couple of you uh, of them a year on you, for instance, with your numbers, and uh, I could make four hundred dollars every time I do it. Instead, I'm only going to make fifty bucks for the visit, you know. So I mean, he but he said I'm not going to pad the bill like that. And so some doctors are very compassionate in the way they do things. You know, they know they're in it to make a living, but they're not in it to gouge people. On the other hand, I had a urologist that every time he found blood in my urine, uh, microscopic blood, which my current urologist says, I've checked it, I check it under a microscope and it isn't there, but a dipstick, it shows up. So there's something the dipstick reacts to in you. And I've had this for 20 years, but I had another urologist who every time I got blood in my urine, did a cystoscopy on me. I had, I had like two cystoscopies through this doctor and he probably was able to charge 500 bucks a cystoscopy and get it from the government. I mean, that's what I'm talking about. You know, you have to know which of your doctors are compassionate and which aren't, which are there to, you know, make you healthy and which are there to gouge you. So, you know, and I, and I, I don't trust any new doctor that I go into like this one that I went into as this big practice with, six different doctors and a huge space off of uh, fifth Avenue, you know, and I think, well, what's the, what's the, how much money is this costing him to run a month? And now what's he going to do to me to make that profit? You know, or is, is he making his profit because he's ethical about it? So I, you know, I, but I don't know the doctor because I never had anything to do with him before. So it's, it's, you know, but Enough of doctors. Jeez almighty. What a You started it. Well, I'm sorry. There are only four people watching this right now. No. <laughs> Alex. Um, you know, you can't mention cancer without people getting pissed off. What? Hey, Alex, thank you yeah. for your service. But I was going to ask you about your VA. Uh, have you had any experience using the VA? VA? No. Marjorie once checked on my, my uh, what I can what I can get because, you know, I am a Vietnam vet folks. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, yeah. I spent the entire time uh, in Hollywood. Um, yeah. We, you checked it, didn't you, Marjorie? Yeah. But it was so long ago. I but I, I do. I am entitled to VA benefits, right? Yeah. I can yeah. go to a VA hospital. I imagine. Yeah, my, uh, my wife is my about to get her uh, knees done. What were we saying? Uh, my wife's about to get her knees done at uh, in, in Palo Alto. The VA there is very good, mm -hmm. and uh, you know she. I, I'm envious about her care because you know I got all this private care through the doctor. Yeah, but how much time did she spend in the military? Um, she was in there for 14 years between Army Reserve and oh, National I, Guard. I was in there for two years. And my dad was <laughs> in for, I, my but, dad was in for less than a year. Yeah. And years, years later, he went to the VA and they set him up. He mm -hmm. was really, you know, yeah. yeah. They, he, he never stopped going back there because it was so cheap and the doctors were so good. Yep. Oh. We didn't think of that one, did we, Marjorie? No, but you can get into a VA nursing home. Now, now the VA. <laughs> how's, how's Thursday for you, Alex? Is that good? <laughs> <laughs> Marjorie's over planning for my future. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, my wife at the at the VA in Palo Alto also gets all the Stanford doctors because yeah. uh, you know they they draw from the local hospitals 
uh, and you get the best of the doctors and nurses and everybody really? else there. So yeah, you know, you might want to check it out. It's a whole new day over there. Um, but again, it is spotty in terms of where in the country you're at. But I would think in New York, you probably have some great resources. Well, Shaki, you live here in New York. Don't you feel yeah. a little uncomfortable with all these hospitals advertising on television? And, and yeah. you, you begin to wonder why they're <laughs> advertising, you know? It, it, it's it, it kind of it's very weird it's very weird but we do have some of the best doctors in the nation in this city i mean i'm very lucky that when i had the prostate thing i had the num the, the guy who wrote the book on you know uh, seed implantation in the prostate and uh he did that what he's been doing that for about 20 years his most famous person that he cured was uh rudy rudy giuliani uh, Oops. <laughs> you know, I've never brought that up to him. I've never brought that up to him. I think I, I said to him something like, well, I, I've read about you and everything I've read is good, right? And he can't believe that I don't know about he and Giuliani. Giuliani. But you remember, you remember that time when Giuliani had his prostate, uh, they pl implanted seeds. And uh, I just hope... Plant them in his head. <laughs> what I'm worried about is maybe maybe the side effect of that operation exactly. is becoming like Rudy Giuliani. Do you feel like overthrowing a government? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I think about it, and I'm going, God, you know, I mean, Giuliani's cranky. He's deluded. He's got hair dye running down the side of his face. Is that is that my future? <laughs> I don't show any Giuliani symptoms, do I, Marjorie? <laughs> Are you stoned or something? I asked you a question. I I, I haven't looked for them yet, but I'll I'll start looking. <laughs> yeah. Here's a here's a new bit I've got for our show. It's a new uh, segment called "What's for Dinner." <laughs> now marjorie marjorie what's for dinner tonight spaghetti and meatballs mm, yeah yes and of course you made the meatballs didn't you no they came from um Stu leonard's which are the best oh, okay so uh let me see here so it's from okay well of course the sauce is the sauce you made because you make a great pasta sauce it's lydia's <laughs> bottles right okay are you gonna uh, boil the water for the spaghetti or yes that i'll do <laughs> oh well <laughs> she you never cooks noodles? anymore she <laughs> never cooks anymore she just warms up stuff from instacart and uh what are the other what's that other place you order from fresh direct fresh direct it gets old after a while it's it nice does get old it does easy. get old I would I would die for a good old home cooked meal sometimes. Mm. I make home cooked meals. I do that chicken dish that you love. Well, <laughs> you love. Good. You, yes. You, you, do you know the chicken dish I'm talking about, or is it not that memorable? <laughs> I know. It's the only thing you make. <laughs> it's my balsamic vinaigrette chicken. And spare ribs. He makes good spare ribs. Make good spare ribs. I'm do those all from scratch, but you don't do anything from scratch anymore. Of late, I haven't. And and what's your excuse? I mean, isn't a good wife supposed to cook for oh husband? My God. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> when he gets home from work. Why, why does he, Marjorie, why does he take his life in his hands like that? <laughs> do you hear him? Gee, am I going to be outed like the guy from Dilbert now? <laughs> yeah. uh, I don't understand what possesses people to on a podcast or a tweet to say things that in this day and age will get them vilified. I didn't actually hear what he said. What did he say? You know? He just is, said, is it something like white people should be afraid of black people or something? Yeah, like they should that? not get together. They should stay apart. Oh, Jesus. Uh, yeah, he said, I wouldn't make a black person a friend right now. Something like that. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Wow. You, Which, can you imagine what people like that, that are stupid enough to come out and say stuff like that, 
what they actually are thinking in their mm. mind. Yes, yes. <laughs> Well, but, but, but the stupidity of saying that publicly in the, in this day and age, you know, I mean, I talked to Marjorie a couple of days ago about all this political correctness, and I don't know how my radio show would have survived the current oh. climate. You I know? don't think you were that bad. Really. Well, you know, well, I mean, yeah, but I mean, all you got to do, it isn't that you're that bad, okay? All you have to do is make one wrong comment one yeah just one or have the wrong guy and, and a whole history of your career goes out the window mm -hmm. you know so i mean i i i i i said to her i don't know if i would have survived these days it, it would be interesting i mean certainly i would feel inhibited that's for damn sure mm -hmm. very careful you, about everything i said did you hear brian cranston's recent comment no. Who? Okay. Brian Cranston on a podcast said that MAGA, Make America Great Again, is a racist comment because when was America ever great for black and brown people? <laughs> well, it's it's just a it's an ill ill an uh, anti intellectual statement. Hmm. You know, it's it's uh, it's jingoism. Make America great. Was it ever great? No. You know, unless you read the history books that were written by white Americans. In some people's minds, there are times when America was greater than it is right now because women couldn't vote, blacks couldn't vote. For them, that was great. Well, you know, I think about, I keep thinking about, oh, well, when I was younger, there were, but when I was younger, you, we were going through the communist, um, um, the communist witch hunts. I mean, how horrible were they? They were terrible, uh, you know, and uh, there were a lot of things going on then. That's why I say, when were we ever great? You know, I mean, you want to go back to prohibition? Was that great? You want to, you know, we, we can go to all these periods of time and there's always something that we were doing that was absolutely horrible. And the common thread through all of that was the way we treated minorities in this country. You well, know, Alex. Um, having, you know, seen my parents and having myself, uh, you know, made my way from the kids table to the adults table, and then now trying to actually participate in the conversation at the adults table, you know, MAGA is, is just another way of saying the war for white America, um, this, yeah. to try to preserve a status quo that yeah. is you know, yeah. eroding in the, in the, in the light of a adverse, you know, diversity and inclusion. Well, you're verging on getting political there, Seraphin. I, I'm trying not to. And that's something that's outlawed from this show. There you go. There you yeah. go. I just, I just come from the invisible ranks, so I have to speak up every once in a while. Well, of course. Of course. You know. Uh, but, I mean, I'm, I'm just saying that, uh, uh, you know, I mean, during World War II, oh, we went off, we fought World War II. We were wonderful. No, we weren't. We wouldn't let any Jews into this country who wanted to flee the Holocaust. They had to go to other countries first. Roosevelt sent a whole boat back to Germany. Yeah, I had a friend uh, who uh, I knew in Houston, Texas, who fled Germany during the Holocaust, and they couldn't come into this country, so they had to go to Cuba, pay Batista a lot of money to get citizenship in Cuba, and then they could immigrate here. You know, so, you know, was that America being great? <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, let's face it. We've always had a very inflated concept of who we are. And we really should try to be what we claim we are. And then we'd be a wonderful country. But, mm -hmm. but that, <laughs> let's not get too political. More perfect union. That's More perfect union. For. Yeah. So, Shecky, you're about to go on your... Uh, your cruise, are you getting ready? Are you happy? Are you spirited for this thing? Not really. See, there's a guy who goes on cruises, and every time I hear about him going on a cruise, I say, well, are you getting ready for it? And he goes, eh, he says exactly what he just said. And I don't know why he takes these cruises if he feels he's inflicting himself with these cruises. <laughs> What's the answer to that, Shecky? It's warm. Yeah. Where are you going, Chucky? Caribbean. Nice. 
But yeah. I don't even think I'm getting off the boat because it's, it's what I call the usual suspects, you know, St. Martin, St. Yeah. Thomas that I've been to. I don't you know. when, you get, when you get, I, I was in one of those ports of call when ships came in and that was down in Belize. Mm-hmm. And they they got all these this whole area with shops and stores and selling stuff and everything, and when the boat isn't hasn't landed, it, there's nobody there. They're it's, closed. Sure, it's like sure. a ghost town. Tumbleweed is going yeah. through it, and yeah. the minute they see the ship out there and the boats are coming in, all of a sudden all these stores open up. They're ready to take everybody's money, and that these people then say, well, "What did you see when you were in uh, the Caribbean?" Oh well, we we, we got off at Belize. Well, you yeah. didn't see anything. You saw this goddamn market, and the boat took it back. Yep. But Shecky says to me, he just likes his uh, his beverage, whatever that yep. beverage yes. might be, and a deck chair. Yep. Right? And, and a and book. A, and a book. And a decent meal every night. Why don't you night? sit on your porch? Because it's 25 degrees outside. Well, right of course, now, now it is, but... <laughs> All I'm saying is you're impatient, you know, another couple of months and you'll be able to sit out there and, <laughs> you know, uh, but. Uh, well, you know, it'll be, it'll be nice. You know, you know? I got to say something. Shecky uh, had a skin condition, which he does. And, and uh, I knew him when he was suffering with it for years. Right. So you sat out on your porch to get a tan to put sun on it because that would maybe make it better. Am I mm-hmm. right about that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, now all of a sudden, they've come out with medicine for what? What did you have exactly? It was well, egg- psoriasis. Psoriasis. So I, was, I was getting Stellara injections, like four. Well, times then he went out. Then all of a sudden, this new stuff came out. He suffered. You suffered with it for years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah. he got these injections. What? How? Are there any places on your body now with psoriasis? It's come back. Much. Yeah, well, know. you can go get this. You could go get the shot again because you can get it once a year, right? No, four times a year. Four times a year. So if you can get bad enough, you go back. But the thing is, we talk about we don't cure things. You know, what have we cured? We cure, we've pretty well cured that. I mean, it you it cleared up on every inch of your body, didn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yes, it did. Yeah. Not that I can check, so I just assume you're telling me the truth. Uh, but that, you know, I I always thought that was I always point that out to Marjorie. That's wonderful what happened to you, because they they found something that had been afflicting people for years mm-hmm. and just horrible for people, and all of a sudden they can fix it now, you know. And I find that and the Stellara injections, I don't think they cost me anything. I think because they Stellara covered it or something. I can't remember now. You know, I think I think uh, Medicare covers it. Or whatever. Well, I was in Medicare. Whatever insurance company you have probably covered it. Yeah. But, uh, I guess. yeah. Uh, so, anyway, so how have you been, Mandy? What's new? Anything since we're getting close to the end of the show and you've been working your ass off there? <laughs> Sorry. I, I am listening. Um, everything's great. Um, just tax season still. And, you know, how's your, how's your, uh, How's your daughter doing up here in New York? I think she's doing okay. I haven't really talked to her that much. Um, we're trying to figure out when I can come visit. Um, she's got two really good friends getting married. So she says she was already had like nine Fridays. She has on the books to take off. Um, but I said, well, you know, I may come and just bother you on the weekend. Well, when and, you when you come to New York, if you got a few minutes, uh, give us a call and we'll get together. Where do you guys live? Do you live in Harlem? We live in Harlem. Yeah. Um, I mentioned that to her and she said, I heard that girls shouldn't go to Harlem. <laughs> that was 30 years ago, Mandy. <laughs> it's changed. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> what's a little what's a what's a little what's a little shooting or mugging between friends? You know. <laughs> and, no, actually, if you took a car up here and you know, if you had Uber drop you off in front of his house, you'd be well. Len seen our place. Len, does <laughs> ours look like part of a slum or anything? Not at all. It's beautiful. Yeah. Oh. I told yeah. that. I've actually seen his building. I think he must live in a good part of Harlem. Yeah. I no, mean, actually, really we lived in one of the worst parts of Harlem. At, oh, really? As we've lived here for the last what? How many years, Marjorie? Twelve. Twelve, 12 years, years yeah. maybe more. 
it's 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 gotten much better. I think Shecky would agree. It's a much better neighborhood than it was. Oh, when I yeah, before, before what? COVID, I had no problem leaving your place at midnight, walking two blocks, and getting in my car. Yeah. yeah, but you might not have wanted to do that maybe ten years earlier. No, yeah. probably not. Yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, people lived huh? here. What? She's lived in New York for like four or five months. What right. is she? You know, she. What does she know? Right, right. You know, she has. I want to come visit you guys, um, but yeah. I don't. I'm just going to have to. No, come that visit out. us and uh, come visit us. And if on the way here, you, if, uh, on the way here, you get mugged. Consider <laughs> that part of the adventure of New York City. Yeah. 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 You know, I'll tell you a funny story. My wife, my ex-wife, Ronnie. Which one? Ronnie. <laughs> you said Ronnie. <laughs> Ronnie um, was born and raised in New York. So then she moves out and she's never and she never got mugged or anything. OK, she comes to move to California with me and she says well, she wants to go home and see her father who's getting older or whatever. And I said, OK, well, why don't you go see him? And she went to New York to see him and uh, she goes and takes a subway and on the subway home, she gets mugged. Wow. If, if she lived here all her life and she had to move to California and come back here in order to get mugged. What has New York become when you had to wait that long to get mugged? You know? <laughs> I mean, come and see the pizza rat too. The pizza rat is around here somewhere. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, well, anyway, listen, uh, we've run out of time here. Son of a bitch. You've been a nice, you're such a nice crowd, He's, you know. And we didn't get too political today, did we? No, no, no. okay. Nah. Who said that? Who said, yeah, huh? What did you say, Mandy? Just talking about today's societal problems. Oh, okay. So, anyways, so, so when you say taxes, are you doing the taxes for the company you work for? I mean, we just, yeah, there's a lot of. Taxes. Yeah. So H&R Block is no help to them. No, we have a CPA in Texas that. I'm a CPA with. in Texas? Well, now we'll have to talk about that. That could be a problem, too. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, hey, Shay, thank you very much. Hey, Shay. <laughs> okay. Uh, Marjorie, thank you. <laughs> Len, always a pleasure having you here. Sure. Edward Berger. Oh, by the way, can I just say something quick? We got time. We got time. Forget I just said Edward Berger because I have to wait right. for the end. <laughs> uh, if you have YouTube and you can get uh, go on and get the uh, Bill Maher uh, podcast. Oh, I, God. I can't remember what it's called. Club Random. Club Random. Uh, there's one with this guy who does this talk show on Fox at night. I can't try to remember his name now. Um, but he's kind of a, he's, he runs a kind of comedy thing at night. Um, Gutfield. What's his name? Gutfield. Gutfield. Yeah. So he does an interview with Gutfield. Go in and uh, eight, uh, what is it? Eight minutes, I think. Okay. Go in eight minutes. And um, Gutfield mentions me. Oh. Yeah. 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 He said, you, you ever heard of Alex Bennett to Bill Maher? He says, yeah, I think I have. Yeah. Um, yeah. I told you to go fuck yourself, you motherfucker. Anyway. Um, <laughs> and and, and uh, he says, uh, well, I used to listen to his show in the morning and he had a comedy comics on. And then he, you know, but. I got mentioned on Bill Maher's podcast. Nice. I yeah. never get mentioned on Mike's podcast. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> You've been mentioned. Huh? You've been mentioned on my podcast. Well, I haven't mentioned on your podcast. Absolutely. Well, the latest one, I'm like the first five minutes being mentioned. Shecky's been mentioned a lot. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, because I pay Shecky to do that. Okay. <laughs> Paul Eleven, thank you very much, and uh, Charlene Solis, uh, always wonderful having you here. Scott Boddicker, it's a pleasure when you call because I know that a lot of times you don't call things, and this show you call all the time, which is really terrific. 
Mandy O'Brien, please, ladies and gentlemen, you can help this young girl. <laughs> if you'll just give your dimes and your dollars to Gabnet Fund. Anyway, um, Mike Chisholm, thank you. Thank you to Vernon Nunn. Always nice, Vernon. And Seraphin. Good to see you. I haven't seen you in a long, long time, and it's always a pleasure having you here. And finally, Edward Berger, ladies and gentlemen, who will sign us off by saying, that's all, folks. <laughs> See you later, everybody. Bye. <laughs>